This is message seven in the series, How to Have the Faith of God. And we're talking about many, many things. We've really focused a lot on the operation of faith. You know, how faith operates. Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, really talk about it. Verse 23, how faith operates as things come against you in your life, right? Mountains come in your life, a mountain of circumstance. The Bible says, whosoever will say to that mountain, be removed. We don't talk to God about our mountains. We talk to our mountain about our God, right? It is written, whoever will say to that mountain, move, will not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Then verse 24 talks about the operation of faith in regards to how do we receive and lay hold of everything that God's given us. It says here, what things soever you desire, when you pray, you must believe that you receive them and you will have them. Isn't that good news? The operation of faith. We've talked a lot about that. Want to encourage you, these messages you can't listen to enough. They will get better every time you listen to them. Because the more the word gets down in your spirit, the more it affects you in every way. So tonight, I just really had it on my heart to start talking about, let's talk about what faith is. You know, years ago, uh, Kenneth Hagin, who's now up in heaven, he's been up there for about 20 years now, he, uh, they wrote a book based on his series, The ABCs of Faith, right? You could say The ABCs of Faith, you could call it Faith Basics, but basically it was this, the first one was What is Faith? And to be honest with you, out of the ABCs of faith, the what is faith you're going to have to spend a lot of time on. Because for some reason, people get tripped up about that. Okay, what is faith? Is this this woo-woo thing or what, what is this, right? So we're going to talk tonight about what is faith. You also have to know how faith comes. We've also talked a lot about how faith comes, right? Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. And hearing comes by the word of God. And remember, we said when you come to the word, you must come to the word with a willingness to do it. Like tonight, you could see, right? A lot of you are here tonight. You could sense the hunger in this place when you just walked in. You could sense when worship started, people were here. They're here to worship and minister to the Lord. Now you guys are here to receive from him, right? Well, how... When you come to the word of God, you never come to it and go, okay, let me read this and I'm going to pick and choose what I want to do and what I don't want to do. You won't hear any of it, right? You have to hear this, read it, study it, meditate in this word. It is full of life and you have to come to it with the standpoint, I have a willingness to do it. If God's word says it, I'm going to do it. Now, I don't have to know how to do it. The Holy Spirit will help me. I don't even have to want to do it, right? If my flesh is giving me a hard time, God will literally empower me. And the Bible says he will energize your spirit to create in you a desire to want to do it. And then he will empower you to do it. It's amazing. So what faith is, how faith comes. But then the third one is how do you release your faith, right? We're going to talk about that because you release your faith with your mouth. Faith, and your mouth and your corresponding actions. But tonight I want to start focusing on what faith is. And I, I get a sense this is going to be a little bit, we might go a few weeks. I'm not moved at all by long series, you know? So I think the longest one was what, 29 weeks on the book of Revelation? I don't know if we'll go 29 weeks, but, but who knows, right? So here's the thing. You could always grow and you could always increase in faith, always, right? And it's so important that we, as the people of God on this planet, live by faith. We must live by faith as we're approaching the end of the church age, right? I mean, all hell is breaking loose on the earth, but I got to tell you, all heaven is breaking loose on the earth too. And, and it's important that you want to be in the game, you want to be a part of this, 
You don't want to be sifted out because you're not believing God. In righteousness, you're, you're fixed, you're immovable. Now I want, you to, I, want, I want you to understand something about faith. And you'll understand this if I use this example. In the world system, the medium of exchange is money, right? Try to operate in this world without money. You, you can't, right? I mean, without money, you are completely limited. But what happens is in everything in your life, if you want to eat, money is the medium of exchange, right? In everything, money is the medium of exchange. This is why God wants you to trust him in your finances. Because you need to have an unlimited source of supply of money. And we all do as Christians if we learn to operate in God's system. Because he's our provider. He's limitless. Right? So, but faith is the medium of exchange in the kingdom of God. So in the world system, money's the medium of exchange. But in the kingdom of God, faith is the medium of exchange. How you receive and if everything from God, from getting saved to everything, is through faith. It all is through faith. So it's very important that we know these ABCs of faith. We know how to grow in faith. We know how to walk by faith. We know how to live by faith. This is talking about a lifestyle, not an event. Not an event here and there. It's a lifestyle. Faith is a lifestyle. When you come to Christ, it, it's a lifestyle change, okay? Very, very important that we get that right. So there's two words used in the New Testament regarding faith, if we take an aerial view of this. The first word is translated faith, okay? It's a noun. It's a present participle. In other words, it's an active word. The other word in the New Testament, it's translated believe. That's a verb, but it's still an active word. It's a present participle active word. Forget the present participle thing, right? If you don't know what that is, don't worry about that. You can move mountains without knowing what a present participle is, right? But you can't move anything without understanding what faith is, okay? So both of these words are ac active words, or I should say this, action words, or I could say it this way, both of these words are active words, Okay, the Bible speaks of faith in the New Testament and in the Old Testament in a number of ways. So in 2 Timothy, we'll jump off here, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, it's talking about faith in a general sense, okay? So let's look at this, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course I have kept the faith. This is talking about faith in a general sense. I have kept the faith. Okay? Paul also spoke about faith, of how faith brings specific results. Not just in a general sense, I've kept the faith, but now, no, no. I, he talked about faith in receiving from what, what God has given us through grace. So let's look at this real quick. Romans chapter one, let's look at verse 16 and 17. Now we took some time with these two verses, but I wanna look at it, I wanna come at these two verses with a different, a different way now. We're talking about what faith is, okay? What faith is. In Romans 1, 16 it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it... The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Unto, this Greek word salvation is sozo. Unto, it means to, unto being rescued. It means delivered. It's the power of God to deliver. It's the power of God to make safe. The power of God to make sound. It's the power of God to make whole. All these words literally 
define the word sozo or salvation. This word literally means to make safe, to make sound. In your mind, it means to heal physically. All that's included in sozo. See, Jesus came to redeem you and I from the curse of the law, right? Galatians chapter 3. Christ hath, past tense. When did he do that? On the cross, right? He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do that? Because he was made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He did that so the blessing of Abraham would be able to come on us, right, as Gentiles, so that we could receive the Spirit of God through faith. But he came to redeem us. He came to redeem us from spiritual death, from sin, from sickness, disease, and pain. If you want to know more about that, we're talking about that on Sunday, right? How that he has provided freedom from all sickness, all disease, and all pain. With all the sickness in the world, we should have three or 400,000 people show up to church Sunday, Amen. right? Actually, if the church ever believed it, we would have three or 400,000 people showing up because what? God heals today? Yes, he does, right? So he came to redeem us from that. He came to redeem us from poverty, from lack, right? All of these things. He came to bring us back to a place as if sin never entered the world. That's what Jesus came to do. Remember, through Adam's sin, it says death or sin entered the world and then death came into this earth realm by sin. Jesus came to make a way for us to live in the kingdom of God in such a way to experience the life of God as if sin never entered the world. He redeemed us from this stuff. That means he bought us out of it and he placed us in the kingdom of God. So we've got to believe that, right? The gospel, the gospel, that means a message that's too good to be true, is the knowledge that we have from God's word about Jesus and what we're redeemed from. Very simply, right? The word of God, the gospels tell us what we're redeemed from. The epistles tell us how to operate, how to see it, lay hold of it, and operate in it. Right? God wants us to. The gospel... According to this, look at this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, but now here it is, to everyone that believes, to the Jew, well actually, let me say it correctly, to everyone that believeth, okay? There's a difference in the King James Version, the reason why they have this E-T-H on the end of these words is because of the verb tenses in the Greek. In other words, it, we would read it like this, to everyone that believes and keeps on believing. Right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God only to those that believe and keep on believing. Do you know what the gospel is to somebody who doesn't believe it? Foolishness. You're doing what on Wednesday night? You actually, you mean you go to church? What do you guys do there? Right? You sit and you listen to some guy talk about the Bible. What? What is that? Right? But to us, it's life. The word of God is life. Right? So this is very important that we see this. The gospel is the power of God to everyone that believes it. Right? Not because... God said it. The gospel is not the power to rescue, heal, deliver, prosper. It's not the power because God said it. It is the power because God said it when you believe it. You must believe it. So this is a big thing, right? So we need to talk about that because believing is a choice. You'll, you'll see if we get there tonight... You must believe in order to come to a place where you know, right? And you, that's all over the book. 
So one definition of faith, faith is the condition that comes from having believed. Okay, that's just one, one definition of faith. We're going to go through several of them. Believing is an aspect of faith. In other words, believing is the beginning of faith. See, you choose to believe and then you act on that belief. And as you act and walk that out, what happens is you every day and every moment of every day become more and more and more fully persuaded. But believing is the beginning of faith. So believing is this. Believing is the act whereby you extend your faith towards God. You're extending your faith in God, right? in your current situation, in your current condition. That's, we have to choose. We hear his word, and all of a sudden, faith comes. We must choose to act on that, right? When, when you hear the word of God, what happens? The first thing, you're like, wow, that's true. I believe that. When you got saved, wow, God loves me. God wants to make me new. God wants to wash me and clean me and make me new and give me a whole new life. Or, man, wow, God wants, God has provided healing for me. God will come into my life and, and fix this financial disaster that I'm in. Right? So then it says this, for therein, verse 17, therein where? In the gospel, right? Right? Is the righteousness of God revealed? How is it revealed? From faith to faith. I love the way Paul wrote this. In other words, it's a growing faith. From the faith that you heard and walked in when you got born again to the faith that you walk in and grow in your whole life for all eternity. And it's revealed. Every time you believe God for something and you lay hold of it and you see it in this realm, boom, it's revealed. Is that what that said? It's not what it said. It's revealed from, I, I tricked you guys. It's revealed from faith to faith. I don't have to see it. When I hear God's word and faith is birthed in my heart and all of a sudden I know he gave that to me. And it's revealed to me that he's righteous and that he made me his righteousness. I'm made righteous with, with his righteousness. I'm an heir to this. Every time I see it. See, you don't have to actually see your physical body change. No, no, faith reveals that you're righteous. It reveals his righteousness because you're fully persuaded. You don't have to see it. You don't have to feel it. It's done. I've, I've believed that I've received it, right? And we're gonna see faith is what will bring substance to that that I can't see. That that I can't perceive with my senses, the mere fact that I have faith, which came from hearing God's word, is my title deed that I have it. Right? I don't have to see my house to know that it's my house if I have the title of it. I don't have to see my car. There's nobody stressed out if, if you own a car and you have the title of it somewhere in your possession, you're probably not sitting here and all of a sudden you start worrying, oh my gosh, is, do I still have a car? No, you don't have to because you have the title, right? If you walked outside your house and there was a guy tow, starting to tow your car away and you had the title, you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You better, you better very gently... Take that car down. Don't scratch it or you're going to pay for that. 
And, and by the way, if you don't immediately start moving, there's three numbers I'm going to dial in my phone, 911, right? Because you're stealing my car. But now, if you don't have the title and you have just forgotten to make your payments for six or seven months, you might run out there and talk to that guy, hey, is there any way that you could just kind of just drop the car and give me one more chance, right? You'd have a completely different attitude towards it. But when you're fully persuaded it's yours, you don't have to see it. You don't have to feel anything. It's yours, right? That's, see, that's faith. So if somebody's like, yeah, you know what? I'm just believing God. And oh, it's so hard. Not faith. The Bible says there's joy and peace in believing. You're not in faith yet. Yeah, but this faith stuff is so hard. That's, no, it's not. You're not in faith yet. Just keep meditating in the word. We'll get you in faith. Because when you get in faith, it's like this. <sighs> wow, it's over. It's over. Right? I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to declare the works of the Lord. I have the money. Right? Your relatives might think you're crazy. Oh, they lost it. Right? Just hide and watch. Those same relatives will be coming to you after they see a few of these things manifest. They'll be like, hey, you know, seriously, yeah. So if we're therein, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say the just shall use their faith. It says the just shall live by faith. They're quoting Habakkuk 2.4. It's an Old Testament scripture. Could you imagine those parents? Let's name them Habakkuk. Thank you so much, mom and dad, right? Do you know it says five times in the word of God, the just shall live by faith. It does not ever say the just shall shall use their faith. Right? We got to go deeper in this. This is a lifestyle change. I changed my lifestyle the day I came to Christ and through faith, I received my salvation. I was made brand new and now, from that point on, I am to walk and live by faith. And the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us to teach us all this. So the literal meaning is, of this verse, righteousness is revealed in you as you grow from one level of faith to another level of faith. It's just revealed. The righteousness of God is never revealed by your feelings. Because you could, you can have some feelings where you don't feel, you feel like nothing, right? So you got to be careful. Feelings are great if they're pointed in the right direction. They will motivate you and excite you to serve God and to walk with him. But feelings are never to lead you. Righteousness, the righteousness of God is never revealed by your feelings. Now, now that sounds silly, but most people are judging everything in their spiritual life by how they feel. Right? You will never know that you are righteous by your feelings. Righteousness is revealed in you as you grow and increase in faith. That's why we talk about these things. As you grow and in, as you grow, or you could say it this way, as I increase in faith, you become more aware of what it means for you to be made the very righteousness of Almighty God. So if you're not growing in faith, you're not going to really know who you are. And all of a sudden, remember, holiness, your behavior flows out of righteousness. So if you're walking by sight and you're flesh-ruled, 
you're not going to know you're righteous, and you're going to have all kinds of trouble with your behavior. Right? Because the enemy's going to start talking you into, man, you were a mess your whole life, you're still going to be a mess, and why would you think any, don't listen to anybody who would tell you any different. Right? But those are all lies of the enemy. So this is why faith is so important. Faith is a lifestyle for the righteous. The Lord told me he was going to bring revelation knowledge to your heart tonight about living by faith. Did you, did you feel it the first time I said live by faith? You could feel it. It was like, whew. God wants to define for you what it means to live by faith. Faith is the lifestyle of the righteous. That's another definition of faith. Faith is the lifestyle of the righteous. Faith is not a fix. Faith is not a spare tire. Now, praise God. Praise God. Faith can be. Right? Faith can be a fix. But no, we want to get to the place where it's not the fix. It's not the spare tire. I live by faith. Right? Faith is how I live. It's my house. It's everything. Many have faith experiences from time to time, but never learn how to live by faith. See, God wants you to live by faith because he wants you to walk under, under the light of revelation knowledge. He wants you to walk in the light of the word of God. I mean, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really notice very much anymore when I'm studying or reading or meditating when light just all of a sudden, when I was younger in the Lord, all of a sudden I'd see something and go, wow, that's amazing, right? Now I just kind of live in this, wow, that's amazing. All of What's amazing? All of it. I mean, he's talking to me about all this stuff all the time. It is so much better, right, than being stressed out. Finally, the Holy Spirit gets you to a position where you give some stuff up so he can get some stuff over to you. See, the enemy loves for you to be concerned about you because it dulls you spiritually. When you live and live by faith, you're no longer concerned about you. I mean, if you really think about it, you could, it wouldn't take you very long to list what you need to change in your life, get scripture for it, believe God, believe you receive, and then now all that's left to do is just do what? Thank him, but your focus is on how could I help other people? which is what you're created to do. When you, get, when you get all concerned about yourself, concerned about your life, it dulls you spiritually. And the Holy Spirit just keeps working to try to get you to a place where you could hear him so that he could start working some stuff out. But that's not the way you want to live. You want to live, you just want to live and walk in this thing, right? That's what we're talking about tonight. Faith is supposed to be something you live by. See, when you and I bowed to the lordship of Jesus Christ, what we did is we committed to a change of lifestyle. No longer do I walk by sight, I walk by faith, which causes me to see things much clearer than by sight. Walking by sight is, is, is not, there's no life in it because Satan can create circumstances and situations in your life that will steal your joy, that will steal your future, your hope, right? Situations, circumstances in your life, God doesn't want you rocked by anything outside. He wants you fortified and comforted and filled with peace, right, on the inside. So that's why we must learn to live by faith. This is so important. But many people don't like this. 
right? Many Christians, it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm a Christian, but wait, I, I invited Jesus into my heart, and I want, you know, I want to go to heaven, and I want him to bless me, but commitment? Whoa, no commitment? Right? Could you imagine how far I would have got with Jeanette if I was not willing to commit? Bye, Felicia, right? <laughs> Talk to the hand. I didn't realize the first time God spoke to her that I was her husband. We go on our first date, and the first she's asking me, Art, do you, do you speak in tongues? I didn't realize our whole relationship was on, on the line right there. I'd never had anybody ask me that. I'm like, well, yeah, well, you know, kind of like, doesn't everybody, right? Right? She told me later, yeah, I, if, if you said no, bye, I'm out. Take me home, see you later. Right? I, I hope I don't get tests like that now. That's how come I walk by faith, man, because, you know, she does make me re-up every year, but I don't understand that, but anyway. Anyway, moving on, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to dig the hole deep. Don't give her a mic, okay. <laughs> the decision to follow Christ is a lifestyle change. It's, it's where now, now, and see, this is the thing. It's a lifestyle change that's completely dependent upon you just trusting and being dependent on God to help you with this because you have no clue. You, you know, no matter how old or how young you are, it's always you do this and then this happens and you do this and then this happens. And then you come to Christ and he's like, okay, I'm giving you everything and none of it's based on that anymore. I've already given it. Now it's just a matter of you laying hold of it. And by the way, you got to do that by faith. By what? Right? And so the Holy Spirit... You get in a situation and he'll start going, okay, let's go. I want you to do this. Well, wait, I can't do that because that makes no sense in the natural, right? Because you're used to looking at the natural. He'll walk you into all of it. But you really committed to a change, right? Do you know what leads you to change? The goodness of God, right? That's the word repent, we think that's a four-letter word. But repent means to change your mind, your will, and your purpose. What causes you to do that? Goodness. The goodness of God. Realizing that he loves you. That he's in this thing forever. That there's nothing you could do to ever, ever make his love for you wane. There's nothing you can do for him to ever start pulling some of that salvation away from you. Right? Man, you've wasted... I mean, did you notice when the prodigal son came home and he had wasted everything? Did you notice the father went and got him his ring, put a brand new Armani suit on him, threw a big party, let's, I mean, and gave everything. Did, did you notice that? He didn't go, okay, now you wasted everything, so I have no trust in you, not giving you anything. He didn't do that, did he? No. God doesn't do that either. The gifts, the callings of God, they're without repentance. He'll never change. Isn't that good, good news? And you can't blow all his stuff, right? You, can't, you just can't do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, we decided when we came to Christ, okay, I'm turning from sin and I'm turning to you. And I need your help every step of the way. And when you enter salvation, that's when you go from living your own life that's separated from your creator to now you are infused with the God kind of life and now the creator comes and you, you live with as one with him. You're not created to figure all this out on your own. It's not in man to know and direct his own steps. It, you can't see the things that God has prepared for you. The Holy Spirit has to show you this stuff. But in order to do that, you got to trust him. you got to know him. And in order to lay hold of all this stuff, you got to believe him. And he's all, in, he's all in with you on this. 
See, this is why we need to know everything we can about faith so that we can live a righteous life. A righteous life is walking by faith. We think about righteous, a righteous life means I don't do anything wrong. No, a righteous life means you walk by faith because the righteousness of God is revealed as you walk by faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Let's turn over there. Oh, I've got so much in me. I just pray that all this I'm saying is making sense to you tonight. Amen. Hebrews eleven six, Look at what it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't say without faith it's very hard to please him. It says without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. In other words, he must believe that he is who he says he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, before you can really come to God, you have to choose to believe that he is who the word says he is. So if you're, have you ever been hit with something in your life that you're like, this makes no sense, this is not fair, and, and, and the enemy's going, yeah, why would God allow that in your life? Right? But see, if you're in that place where you're going to get mad at God because you don't understand some things, you're cutting yourself off from your life source. Because when, when you come to God, you have to believe that he is who he says he is. So when these things happen in your life, you have to go, okay, God, I might not understand all this right now, but this is what I do know. You love me. You're with me. You're a God of restoration. You're a God that I can trust. You are good all the time, right? And, when, and that will take you through and out of everything, right? This is so, so very important. This is why many never receive their healing, this is why many never walk in their provision. This is why many never experience their victory. Because before you come to God, you must choose to believe that he is who he says he is. Right? It's impossible for you to come to God for your healing if you don't know he's a healer. If you don't choose to believe what his word says, that he's a healer. It's going to be really hard for you to lay hold of the finances that you need from him if you don't know him or don't choose to believe that he is a provider. Right? This is, this is and see, you can't fake this. Because immediately what, what trips you up with faith is you start to think, okay, what do I need to do to figure this thing out? Nope, give it up. Go to the Lord and say, listen, you created me to walk by faith. You put your spirit in me so that I can know the things that you freely have given me. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God and an heir of all this stuff. And, you, and he will lead me into all the truth. He will literally take me by the hand and help me lay hold. This is literally what the Holy Spirit does. In life, sweetheart, can I use you as an example? So it, let's say this is Jeanette's answer, right? And I'll be God in this scenario. So you're over here. And so she is struggling in life. She needs something. And she chooses to believe that God is who he says he is. The Holy Spirit on the inside will take her by the hand, and he will lead her, and he will literally help her to lay hold of it. And he'll keep his hands around it, and he'll keep prompting her, hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. Okay, the enemy's coming. He's going to throw this thought. Here's a scripture. It is written. He will help you. That's what he does. Thank you, sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> 
he, he so gently, he'll meet you right where you are. All of you can have a PhD in living and walking by faith. Do you realize five times the God of heaven who said, light be, and light is still going. The universe is still being created at the speed of light. We don't even know when he said that. We know Adam and Eve were created about 6,000 years ago. We have no idea when he created the heavens and the earth. But that word, no word of God ever comes back void. And five times he said, the just shall live by faith. That means you and I, it literally empowers us to live by faith. Isn't that amazing? Because he can't lie. So don't fight it. Don't try to micromanage it. Get rid of your own agenda and just embrace him. You can trust him every time. Because see, he did all of this for us while we were his enemy. He, did, he provided all of it. Now we're his kids. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. It's gone. What you've done is gone. Yeah, but I did it this afternoon. It was still paid for and gone 2,000 years ago. Go ask God. God, what? what? There's, no, there's nothing. Because Jesus' blood erased it. Unless God lied in Romans chapter 8, which he didn't. Isn't that good news? That's too good to be true. Yes, it's the gospel of salvation. Right? Faith is the sole ingredient for all of you cooks. This is my, I could cook this. Right? Anything else? I mean, maybe scrambled eggs because you got to add a little milk. I, do you add milk, right? Yeah, milk. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, something like that, but I like these soul ingredient things, like ego waffles. Whoosh, boom, I could do that. Here's the soul ingredient to please God, faith. That's it. Isn't that amazing? If you are operating, now you guys are still laughing at me. If you are operating in faith, you will be full of hope. And full of the awareness that God loves you. Faith works by love. So as you walk by faith, you are constantly saturated in the reality that the God of heaven loves you. Unconditionally. Unconditionally. Wow. So let's go over to James chapter 1. Let's go through another scripture. James chapter 1 in verse 5. You guys doing okay tonight? Yes. Hallelujah. God's word is so good. Thank God we're not religious. Man. Whew. James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, now remember we're talking about what faith is. Let him ask of God, well who is God? He's the one who gives to all men liberally. In other words, when you ask God for something, he will always give you more than what you ask him for. Amen. Father, I need $500. He'll never just give you $500. Amen. He'll give you more. Because he, he's the God that gives to all men more than enough liberally. And he's also the God that upbraideth not. That means, that, that Greek word means God is a God who does not get down on you for the mess you've created. And everybody said, amen. amen. Right? I mean, thank God. So he'll give you more than you need, and he won't get down on you for the mess. Now, if you grew up with parents that got down on you for the mess, that's not the way God parents you. Isn't that good news? Right? Because isn't it true, like, the last thing you really need anybody to do is tell you, okay, let's talk about this because you really messed up. You, you know, right. right? He upbraids not, and it shall be given to him, but look at what it says, but let him ask in faith. 
Faith asks. Okay? Nothing wavering. That means, that means to differ or contend with. It means to oppose. You can't waver. You can't try to be in, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Do you know what causes you to waver? Is when it's all based on your behavior and who you are. But there's no wavering when it's all based on him. See, that's why faith, see, faith is very easy. It's very simple. It's we cloud it with us, right? But no more of that. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. See, these waves go wherever the wind goes. God does not want you to be moved by the outside ever. God wants you only moved from the inside. Okay, he talks about that all the time. Nothing wavering. What does that mean? That means to cease from your own struggles. Stop, just give yourself a break. Yeah, you might have messed up. Yeah, what you're facing, it seems like there's no way out. Don't worry about that. God will make a way, right? Nothing wavering. Ceasing from your own struggles. See, the devil will always try to get you to waver. And this is how he stops the believer. He tries to get you to waver. Why is that not working? Hmm, you asked God and now it got worse. Right? He's trying to get you to look at what's going on in his kingdom instead of look at what's going on in your kingdom. This is all done. Jesus did not hang on a cross and say it's about finished. No, it's finished, which means he's finished. Right? The lifestyle of the righteous is an unwavering lifestyle. If God said it, I believe it, and I will have it. The end. I don't have to see it. I don't have to feel it. It, it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't matter if it's never happened to anybody else on the whole planet. God's word says, and he'll do it. Right? Right? James goes, it's real interesting here, he goes from asking in faith to a person. Did you notice that? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it'll be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. See, there's only two options. There's the person who asks in faith, and then there's another person named here, one who wavers. There is no middle ground. If you're not walking by faith, and if you're not asking in faith, you are wavering. If you're walking by sight, you're wavering. Right? Man, I'll tell you, if you have ever been in the ocean and you are caught in a riptide in the ocean and you're trying to swim to shore and you're swimming as hard as you can go and you're going backwards, that, that's, that, can, that can get that, that spirit of fear all over you real quick, right? But that's the way it is a lot of Christians live in that. They're wavering. They're, they, they're being moved by all these circumstances that they don't think they have any control of. And that's why, what do you do if you're wavering? You mark 11, 23. You speak to the wind and you tell the waves to stop. Right? Right? In Jesus' name, and there will be a calm. Where will it be? Right on the inside of you. And all of a sudden, you'll know, wait a minute, I'm no longer being moved on the outside. Cancer is a pretty big word if it's compared to you or I. 
but it's not big if it's compared to him. Especially when he said, listen, I sent my word and healed you. Right? Only two options. You have to know that. See, that's why we preach these things. There's so many Christians that are just, just being tossed all over the place by every circumstance in their life. I hope my kids turn out all right. Forget that. No, no, declare that my kids will turn out all right. I sure hope I don't get sick. No, no, no. No, put faith to it. It says here, verse 7, For let not that man, what, what man, the man without faith, think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Notice how it doesn't say, For let not that man think that God won't give him anything. It, he, that the Bible could not have said that because God's already given you everything. It's not a matter of him giving you anything. It's a matter of you receiving it. He's al it's already yours. You own everything that you'll ever need in life. All the money, all the health, all the strength, everything you'll ever need in life has already been bought and paid for and it's prepared on a table for you. And then God put his spirit in you. He had to make you brand new, put his spirit in you so that you won't miss it. So that you'll know, hey, that's freely given to me by God. And then he will literally help you lay hold of it. Wow. Faith is the necessary ingredient to receive anything from the Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to receive anything from him. So from those two statements, therefore we know what pleases God is when we receive from him. Amen. In Psalm 145, verse 8, it says, For the Lord is gracious. Do you know it doesn't say he has some graciousness? It says he is. Do you know what the word gracious means? It means, I'm glad you asked, it means disposed to show you favor. What really excites God is when you lay hold and receive what he's given you. Think of Jesus. Think of what he paid for to get, get all that stuff to you. He wants you to lay hold of every, every bit of it, right? He doesn't want you to go through life with lack when he's provided everything. He doesn't want you to go through life with sickness and disease, fighting depression. He doesn't want you afraid, right? All this stuff, he doesn't want you going through life with unfulfilled desires, because he's paid for all this. Man, that just sounds like the gospel. See, but we cannot, we cannot do this apart from him. We can't receive from him apart from him. Right? We have to hear his word so that faith is birthed so that we can receive what he's given us. Do you see that? We do nothing apart from him. I love this. So faith is the condition that comes from believing God. Here's another attribute about faith. Faith never wavers. In other words, the issue that I'm facing is settled because I've chosen to believe what God said. It's settled. Boy, we just need to, it's almost like a Selah moment. Just think about that for a second. It's settled. Faith is a settled condition. That's why we say faith is a rest. The condition of having believed. That's why genuine or true faith never gives up. The lifestyle of faith is a choice. Everything God says is absolute truth. We have been given literally the great honor to believe God. Wow. Then it says in James 1.8, it says a double-minded, that means a wavering, a double-minded man, or a man, you could say it this way, a man who doesn't know what is true, is unstable in all his ways. 
See, when you're unwavering or when you waver, what, what does that mean? You don't know what's true. But when you know what's true, you won't waver. So that's why we meditate in the word. So the Holy Spirit could open it up and we could see it. Right? That's why, see, the word of God, how can I say this? Do you know how in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God? Right? You know how God and his word are one? Do you realize God's word and you are to be one? The Holy Spirit wants to literally etch the word of God into every fiber of your spirit. So it's not just something you believe, it's something that's alive in you. Right? And it's manifesting out of you. And that's faith. Wavering is not something that Satan makes you do. You have to know this. Oh, he'll create circumstances, he'll do everything, but wavering is your choice and my choice. You don't ever have to waver. No thoughts of doubt can ever make you waver unless you accept them to be true. Satan doesn't want you to know that. That's great. No thoughts of doubt can ever make you waver unless you accept them to be true. In other words, all this teaching about how God's in control, God's wanting you to know you're in control. He's already provided stuff, but for him to be in control of your life, in other words, that's going to be your decision. Let me say it again. No thoughts of doubt can ever make you waver unless you believe them to be true. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Hmm, did you get that? Not just in the ways that he's double-minded in. If you're double-minded, you're unstable in all of your ways. Why? Because he who comes to God must believe that he is. So that's why the Holy Spirit wants to eradicate all wavering out of you. Because he doesn't ever want you to be unstable in all of your ways. He wants you to be stable in all of your ways. See, when you entertain wrong thoughts, it weakens you spiritually. When you when you meditate in the word of God and you fill, God, you fill your thought life with God's word, it builds spiritual strength in you. It turns the light up in your life to where all things become possible. When you entertain wrong thoughts by looking at outward things, it saps spiritual strength. It makes everything cloudy so that you just don't, you don't know which way to go and what to do. Being double and being double-minded in one area of your life will affect every area. What am I saying? We must be established in God's word. We must know what God's word says to us, what he has given us, what belongs to us. So, so far, we see that faith is a lifestyle. We see that faith pleases God, right? We see that faith literally is the means by which you receive everything from God and faith never wavers, okay? So we'll talk more about this next Wednesday. You guys doing okay? The word of God is full of life. We're gonna get this. You could call this faith school, amen?